my basic philosophy, which grows out of the nonviolent tradition, is that a moral man cannot in good conscience accept injustice and adjust to an evil system. He must resist it. He has a moral obligation to resist evil. But in resisting it, he must recognize that he stands on higher moral grounds when he will resist that unjust system nonviolently. The individual seeks to achieve moral ends through moral means. And I think this is what nonviolence is saying in the final analysis, that means and ends must cohere. And that uh, in order to bring about a just society, and a righteous society, it is necessary to use just and righteous methods. Good morning. Grace and peace be with you today. Thank you for thank you all for joining us. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the 2023 Montgomery County em Employees Black History Month program. This year's theme is Black Resistance. I'm Anthony Skinner, and I work with the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. I want to take this time to thank the county departments and agencies and the Office of the County Executive for making this year's program possible. Thank you for, for the many ways you support our efforts. I want to especially thank all of our Black History Month planning committee members for their commitment, determination, and enthusiasm in planning a great program. At this time, I want to introduce our moderator, Mr. James Stowe, and our co-moderator, Ms. Tiffany Ward, both leaders in their own right. You may know Mr. Stowe as the director of the Office of Human Rights and as a tireless advocate working towards eliminating racism and discrimination in our community, and Tiffany Ward, who serves as the county's chief equity officer and has hit the ground running by informing county staff on the co-tenants of racial equity. But at this time, I need to pause for a minute. Um, I have some sad news. One of our, our Black History Month committee members passed away over the weekend. Her name is Watina Temple. And I would just ask, ask at this time if you would allow us to have, have a moment of silence. Thank you. So I went with this. I'm really excited about today's program. Um, so much work has been put into it. And I invite you today to relax and enjoy and be informed and encouraged and strengthened by the wonderful program we have for you. Thank you and enjoy. Good morning, all of you, to my fellow uh, colleagues from across the county and to all of those who may be listening in from our community. Uh, again, I extend uh, again Anthony's welcome one more time uh, to welcome all of you to this uh, program. We hope that you not only will enjoy the program, but also, uh, and I'm going to echo something uh, Anthony just said as well, to be encouraged, to be uplifted and inspired. Uh, about uh, what you, in fact, will, will witness uh, over the next uh, uh, a minute, few minutes or so, and and also thinking in terms of uh, what contributions that you might be able to make uh, in your community, wherever you may find yourself. Uh, so stay tuned. Now, my friends, it's time then to have the presentation of colors, uh, and we'll have that at this point by the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation's Honor Guard, after which you'll hear then the national anthem, uh, and then also lift every voice and sing uh, by P.J. Gregory with the Montgomery County Police Department.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's again uh, thank the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation Honor Guard uh, and uh, certainly uh, our colleague uh, who plays the smoothest sax that one could ever imagine, P.J. Gregory with the Montgomery County Police Department and that beautiful rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Thank you all uh, for getting us started uh, in this great way. I am so pleased to have join us also one of our young people of this great community, uh, Daniela Gagno, uh, is a student uh, at Northwest High School uh, in Montgomery County Public Schools, and she is a national uh, Silver Award winner uh, in the NAACP AXO uh, competition, which is a competition that looks at academics and artistic rendering from our students all across the country. Uh, and uh, Danielle has been in this program and I watched her grow and and she has grown into just a fine, beautiful young lady. And she is someone who has a special way with the spoken word. And so now without any further ado, Daniela Gagno, her version of the spoken word. Thank you. I now present to you Black Mona Lisa. They say the color black is, they say the color black absorbs all the light that falls on it. I say the same about black skin. When you're forced to absorb all the light that falls on you, of course you'll be left sitting in the dark, desperate for some hope of your own. The color black is associated with death, darkness, grim. To be colored black is an association with death, unarmed, lynched. It's funny how they call us colored. Paint a picture of rich chocolate with the dark marker keep scribbling until the white becomes brown and the colors turn darker and darker. Oh, how they love paintings. So they take whips to make sure black bleeds red, use fists till eyes turn blue. How they admire the way silver complements black skin. So they adorn us with jewelry in the form of chains. A white Picasso illustrates honey with every other their color but gold, uses black and brown as a base for their red, white, and blue painting, framing it in preparation for an art gala where they take concepts of carefully carved, created things from the motherland. They carve it meticulously until the sketch of slavery becomes the representation of black history, beautiful history, branded, bended, and broken from the moment selfishness slithered, suffocating perfection, causing us to fall, damning us to hide in shades of red and of blue and of white, illustrated with stars. A starry night was the artwork on the African midnight sky until colonization brushed motherland away on ships. Water carried color, leaving streaks of red. Blood delivering ships to an art gala with concepts of rainbows capable of containing so much pain, so much color. They all come out black, the Van Goghs. The Da Vinci is all painted in black as it's forced to absorb and withstand so much color. Standing in the middle of an art gala where all the paintings are midnight, yet the title on the door is freedom and the banner promises lights. Black markers outline beautiful pictures like black bodies outline beautiful countries. People resent the color black because they say it makes all things dim. The color black is forced to absorb all the light that falls on it. And I say the same about black skin. Thank you. Wow. Daniela Gagno. And let's give her a virtual round of applause. She can't hear us, but, but make sure we do that. Because again, this is one of our young people who, matter of fact, let me make sure I'm clear about this now. This is her words. This is her spoken word. Uh, and so uh, she, in fact, is the author of that marvelous piece. And so, uh, again, we are so very pr proud of her and wish her all the very, very best. Again, a NAACP AXO National Civil Award winner uh, from Montgomery County. What about that? Again, thank you so much, Daniela. Really appreciate that indeed. Uh, next up uh, is our colleague uh, uh, and a woman who has begun the process of doing a really, really tremendous work uh, an arduous task 
uh, in putting together our uh, social, um, I should say racial equity and social justice program uh, and doing so uh, with grace. Uh, I'm so pleased to have our colleague join us today and you've already heard her introduction, so I'll just give her uh, over to her and let her take it from here. Tiffany Ward, please take it away, my colleague. Thank you, Director Stowe. Uh, as Director Stowe said, I'm Tiffany Ward. I'm the Director of the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. Really happy to be invited uh, to moderate or co-moderate uh, with Dr. I'm sorry, with Director James Stowe. Uh, our office in this February of Black History Month is uh, steady working to evaluate our budget uh, for the tenets of racial equity. Look at all of our our budget and uh, resource allocations for racial equity. So as we end the month, you should know that our, our small team of about six uh, has looked at the budget, both capital and operating budget for uh, for the racial equity impacts. And so as we start our uh, our program uh, for uh, Black History Month, I want to thank all of you all for being here. I want to thank you for supporting our office and supporting uh, the Office of Human Rights and of course the folks who have uh, organize this wonderful event. I'm here to, to introduce a couple of our speakers. Uh, and first up uh, is someone who really doesn't need an introduction. Uh, county Executive Mark Elrich uh, has just started his second term as our county executive and comes to bring us remarks uh, on the opening of our uh, Black History Month celebration. Council County Executive Mark Elrich. Alrighty. Maybe the county executive is not just here yet. It's all right. All right. All right. We will go on to um, to have our uh, our folks from the county council actually give us uh, remarks. I am very happy to introduce you all to Pamela Luckett. Pamela Luckett is the deputy chief of staff for council council president Evan Glass. She comes to bring us welcome from county president Evan Glass and the county council. Pam. Thank you, Tiffany. Good morning, everyone, and happy Black History Month. I'm delighted to bring greetings from Council President Evan Glass and the County Council. Council President Glass sends his deepest regrets for not being able to join you today. Unfortunately, he has an Economic Development Committee meeting that is happening at this exact same time. Council President Glass asked me to start by thanking every Montgomery County employee for what you do each and every day to make our county run smoothly. We are extremely fortunate to have such a dedicated workforce and we're grateful for all you do. I also want to thank Director Jim Stowe and his team for making sure this incredible program happens every year. Black History Month is an opportunity for us to celebrate the many contributions that African Americans have made to this country, from the traffic light on the corner to the automatic gear shift in your car, your home security system, and the color computer monitor on your desk. It is rare that any of us go throughout our day without the benefit of one of the many great inventions by African Americans. However, in spite of all our contributions, we know that the history of African Americans in this country is also one of resistance as reflected in this year's theme. Despite the persistent discrimination and disparate outcomes that racism has caused in our society over hundreds of years, African Americans have resisted and made monumental contributions in science, business, technology, arts, and in politics. Resistance has always been a powerful tool in the democratic process, particularly in the fight for, ra for racial equity. This fight for justice continues. As we celebrate Black History Month here today in the county, we are proud to live in Montgomery County, home to some of the most diverse cities in the country and where hate has no place. Thank you again for inviting us today. Again, many greetings and enjoy uh, the rest of today's program. Thank you, Pam, for your thoughtful words. Very much appreciate it. We are going to go on to our next speaker who will actually present the Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things Award. The next speaker is Paris Lee. Paris is one of the newer members of our, uh, our workforce. Paris joins, he's an equal opportunity manager here in the county, and he has joined the county, like I said, just in 2022. 
He brings nearly two decades of public service experience with the last 15 years in equity and inclusion and EEO investigation and compliance practices. Most recently, Paris served as a deputy director for civil rights and fair practices in the Maryland uh, Transportation Authority, where he was proactively managing the agency's equity programs to ensure compliance with federal and state regulations. Prior to working with MDTA, Paris worked at the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Paris earned his BA in political science from UMBC. Welcome, Paris. Thank you, Tiffany. On behalf of the Office of Human Resources, the Equal Employment Opportunity Division, and the Black History Month Planning Committee, I welcome you once again to this wonderful tradition. I would first like to take a moment to thank all of the nominees for their dedication and hard work, and to be considered for this award as a recognition of their hard work and dedication to the citizens of Montgomery County. It is my privilege to share the names of the two recipients of this year's Montgomery County Service Award, the Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things Award. These employees consistently and without wavering have gone above and well beyond their professional functions in their jobs, demonstrating absolutely no boundaries with respect to how much they do, how hard they work, and their deep commitment and passionate service for Montgomery County and its residents. This year, this award is presented to employees in our workforce who have done extraordinary things. Officer Marcus Dixon, the fifth district community service officer and officer John Johnson assigned to the school safety unit. Since March of 2020, both of these officers have volunteered their time at the Up County Hub, which is a food and supply distribution center in Germantown. From traffic control to loading vehicles with food to presenting safety measures to the communities they serve, especially in the Germantown area, they, the help they have provided has been vital to the success and the trust the local communities have in the hub. To be clear, many instances, these individuals have come to help on their own off days. Both officers assisted with, with providing turkeys to residents in the Middlebrook Gardens community as well as partner with Montgomery County Public Schools and Fire and Rescue to develop a safety plan for children waiting and entering the school bus in that neighborhood. They have gone above and beyond their duties to help the residents during these very difficult and unprecedented times. Thank you both Officer Dixon and Officer Johnson for your unyielding service to Montgomery County government and the residents. Thank you all and back to you, Jim. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Paris. Uh, we too uh, collectively want to add our congratulations uh, to these fine persons, to our colleagues uh, for all the work that they do uh, for this community. And I love the way you phrase that going up and beyond, beyond the call of duty to assist and be a part of this community. Uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, we're now uh, joined by the county executive. And so we want to make sure we interrupt our program just a, a second or two because he's now been able to join us. Uh, so let's welcome again uh, our County Executive Mark Elrich uh, uh, for his welcome and any remarks he might like to make. County Executive. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. We can. Okay. So I want to I want to thank you, um, Jim, and I want to thank Tiffany and everybody who's involved in putting this program together today. Uh, it is it is a very interesting topic. I mean, just talking about resistance sometimes can be a hard thing to talk about. Um, but the fact of the matter is that there would have been no progress had there not been resistance. Um, things are not given to people because they're the right thing to do because if that had been the case, these things would have happened a long, long time ago. And it took, you know, real efforts on the part of people in, in the community, particularly, you know, folks in the black community to make the kind of changes that we've been able to make. And, you know, we've got a way to go still, I, I still believe. Um, I'm really happy to join in honor of um, Montgomery County's Black History Month program, and I want to welcome all the employees, directors, and elected officials who have come here this morning. And uh, 
thank you for everybody for being here for this observance of Black History Month and look at the important topics and, and issues that affect Black lives, history, and culture in the United States. And this year's program theme, as I said, was is Black Resistance. And it follows the um, theme of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, also known as ASALH. Um, black resistance refers to the way in which African Americans have used peaceful methods of resistance to achieve civil rights, to protest justice, uh, injustices, and to demand equality. And uh, I just wanted to just say quickly here that the study of African American history and life um, seems to offend a lot of people. You know, there's this fear of critical race theory, and all critical race theory is, which isn't actually what it says, the name's not even the name anybody put on it themselves, is really the honest studying of American history. And that includes the honest studying of the history of African Americans in the United States. And it's a real crime that you get governors of this country who are talking about removing slavery from textbooks and not talking about the civil rights movement and just obliterating all the work that was done to improve America. And they themselves not even realizing that this work was done to improve America. They'd rather obliterate it than at least own the fact that people work together to make progress. And it's just kind of a sad commentary on where we were. Um, there are examples of, you know, of resistance. You know, we think most frequently about Dr. Martin Luther King, as well as the bus, bus boycott sit-ins and voter registration initiatives. Um, there are other important leaders that, you know, go back a long way. W.E.B. Dubois was, a, you know, an historian and commentator on the situation of black, black people in America. Paul Robeson was an amazing musician um, who played a role in the civil rights movement. Even a, a more contemporary person, Harry Belafonte, um, played roles in, in rallying people and, and marking out resistance. And you can't talk about resistance without talking about people like Stokely Carmichael and uh, Malcolm X, um, James Baldwin, and all these other people who played a role in saying these things need to be not just talked about, but they need to be dealt with. Uh, more recently, we see African-American resistance in the form of movements like Black Lives Matter, a movement that protests the injustices in the police and judicial system. <clears throat> and it certainly continues to have complete validity since you know the, the events of recent days show that some of this some of this just goes on and on and on. And uh, we have a ways to go to make sure that we can say this has ended in this country. In, in Montgomery County, many brave African-Americans resisted injustices such as physician Webster Sewell. He was a citizen activist who pushed for non-discrimination in medical care in the 1950s. Another local resistor was William Gibbs, who in 1936, <clears throat> with the backing from the local chapter of the NAACP and the Maryland State Colored Teachers Association, successfully sued the Board of Education that resulted in equalized salaries for the white and black teachers. Um, in the 1960s, African-Americans in Montgomery County protested the segregation of Glen Echo Amusement Park, which led to the support of um, President and Attorney General that ended with the full desegregation of the park. I, you know, some of you remember that in Silver Spring in 1960, when people were talking about planning Silver Spring, Silver Spring was supposed to be a white community. There was a fantasy that it would be the haven for the white flight out of the District of Columbia, and Silver Spring would be white. Um, if you go back to the deeds on many properties, particularly in the older parts of the county, you'll see restrictive covenants that you couldn't sell property to a black or a Jew in many parts of Montgomery County. And that was the norm. That wasn't the exception, it was the norm. Rosemary Hills was the first consciously integrated single family neighborhood in Montgomery County. And it comes about around 1949, 1950. And this is all part of the history we have here that people need to know about. I feel 
I think about young people who have no sense of how we got where we got and take whatever privileges and rights they have for granted because they don't understand that these weren't given. They weren't resolved after the Civil War where everybody lived happily ever after. These are all things that people got from struggle and resistance. That's the only way that happened. And young people need to understand that because what is given can be taken away. And you have to approach this with a sense of people, my, you know, your grandparents, your ancestors work to make things better and that all of us have an obligation to protect the gains that people were able to make. So these are, you know, some local examples of African-Americans, you know, locally and across the nation who continue to resist racial injustice in all of its forms. And I, and I hope that, you know, in the audience, you know, people learn from the information shared by the panelists today. Consider putting into practice the peaceful methods of resistance that may build upon the history of African-American resistance that led to the many freedoms and civil rights that have improved the lives of the people today. And I urge people to call on everybody to do more than just words that, you know, kind of goes with, you know, the civil rights legislation. 1960s. These were great bills and they were great words. They did not change on the ground the living conditions for black people. They did not address overcrowded housing. They didn't address slumlords. They didn't, re you know, give people educations they never got or opportunities they never got. They didn't instantly open up the schools. They didn't desegregate neighborhoods. They were words. Words are easy. And we like to remember them and they're historic. But words that aren't matched by action remain just words. And communities can't eat words. You eat food. You need opportunities to work. You need opportunities for better education. So we've made progress, but we need to continue to work to transform the progress we've made from the words people said to what we actually do in terms of how we construct our society. And to that end, I want to acknowledge all the county employees who go above and beyond their jobs and duties and who've been nominated by the department and recognized by an award at your annual Employee Black History Month program. This year's committee will present its 2023 reward for ordinary people doing extraordinary things to another deserving individual. And I congratulate the recipient who will be acknowledged later in today's agenda. Um, so I hope you enjoy the program. I want to thank you for everything you do. I want to you know, continue to encourage uh, Tiffany Ward and the Racial Justice, Equity and Justice Group to continue doing their work and for all employees, not just to participate and learn, but to take what we learn about injustice and what we learn about equity and apply it at your workplace. I mean, all of you are allowed to ask the question is what I see in front of me equitable. That's not the province of a committee. And the whole point of trying to bring the education and training down to the worker level in this county is so that you're empowered to, you know, in the quaint phrase that everybody uses too much, but it's appropriate. If you see something, say something. If what things don't appear right, we need to know what doesn't appear right. So I want to thank you for giving me a couple of minutes to talk to you about this. Uh, I, I know this is important to all of us and it's very important to me. Um, I grew up in an America that was transforming from the 1950s. I was actually born in 49. I try not to claim the 40s, but I'll start with the 50s. And I grew up in that world that was transforming and uh, it continues to transform. But it's only going to do that if we continue to do the work that's required to make it transform. So thank you again. Thank you so much, County Executive, uh, uh, for uh, those words. And we know behind those words uh, are also action. And we're so very uh, blessed to have uh, you in the leadership role of this county, along with county council members and all of us who make up your team. Uh, uh, to ensure that we are doing our very, very best uh, for the residents of Montgomery County. Again, thank you, County Executive Elrich. Uh, now, my friends, it is my great joy uh, to bring back before us uh, our colleague, Officer P.J. Gregory, 
with the Montgomery County Police Department who will be performing a very special number. Uh, and so let's uh, sit back and enjoy the silky smooth sounds of PJ Gregory with the Montgomery County Police Department. Uh, take it away, Officer Gregory. Friend, my friend, thank you so much for delivering again uh, to Officer P.J. Gregory. He does it every year, and and what a treasure he is for us uh, in uh, Montgomery County government to have someone we can call upon to um, play in such a way that you have actually feel feel what he is playing and what he was playing. By the way, someday, 
someday we'll all be free. Uh, Donny Hathaway number, and many of you may remember him. Uh, Donny Hathaway as a marvelous, marvelous singer in, in his own right, and certainly uh, uh, PJ Greger has done justice to of the song this morning. So thank you again, Officer Greger. Really appreciate that. Now, my friends, we are uh, really embarking upon the really heart and soul of our particular program this morning. We've got a just a wonderful panel discussion for you coming up. Uh, and I am so pleased to have joining us today uh, for this panel, uh, those who are looking at the issue of black resistance. Uh, and they're looking at this particular theme and topic from the framework within their own experience. Uh, and so we're very, very glad that they've agreed to be a part of this discussion. And so let me introduce them to you uh, right now. I'll do so in brief because I will make sure we spend the lion's share of the time actually hearing from them. Uh, uh, first up is uh, Christine Tina Clark. We know as Tina Clark and uh, been here in this era all of her life, uh, some 60 years in public service and education. She's a historian, an advocate. Uh, she's an activist. Uh, Tina, I can go on and on and on about all the things that you are and all the hats that you end up wearing. Uh, but the most important thing that she does is, I believe anyway, that she does anything she possibly can to help educate our children, to get them on the path toward knowing and, and appreciating uh, what learning is about. Uh, and as important, uh, what it means then to be part of this world community here in Montgomery County. And so I appreciate her so much for that. And if there's anything that she can do to assist anybody in this community, she is the first one, the first one in line uh, to do so. And so that's Christina, Christina, I should say, Tina Clark, that I know and that many of us know here in this community. So again, Tina, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate your presence. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to just introduce everybody if we can uh, to our folks uh, uh, who are uh, handling our program today. Let me go through and introduce everybody. If you can give me the next person up online here, uh, we'll go through that and we'll come back and we'll ask Tina to give a, 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 her opening comment. Next up is Willie King. Uh, and what can I say about her that, uh, well, let me just say, uh, a person who has been on the front lines of the movement uh, uh, in the early part of her career, and she'll say more about that a little later on, um, but someone who's been there on the front lines doing the heavy lifting uh, long before it was, in fact, uh, fashionable, as they say, to do so. Uh, been engaged in a number of activities throughout uh, her lifetime uh, in the area of the civil rights movement. Uh, also involved a little bit as well into uh, working for the federal government and, and the sector as well. And so she's had that experience to kind of add to all the things she's done. But I suspect the thing for her that, for me anyway, that kind of speaks out more than anything else, and she's going to say more about this, so I might want to steal her thunder in that regard, but uh, knowing how to support and be there for the likes of persons like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at a time in the civil rights movement that it needed persons to carry out the task and responsibility associated with being a part of something very, very special, even though at that time, they may not have even known the power and the influence that their work has has had and would have, in fact, on indeed the entire world. And so for that reason, I just appreciate her so much. And so you can hear more about her uh, in, in her own comments. So Willie King, thank you so much for being who you are. And thank you for being a part of this discussion this morning. Willie King, thank you. Uh, next up is Joan Mulholland. Uh, Joan uh, is uh, the kind of person who has committed not only the young part of her life uh, uh, in this way in terms of the movement, but her entire life, even today, even today, uh, still working, uh, still in the front line. She is one of those persons who were involved in the freedom rides that, that took place here in this country that tested the whole, uh, uh, whole idea, I should say, of public accommodations being available to all persons. Indeed, they were not. Uh, and so uh, she was part of that movement uh, and also sat in all across the South, um, was a victim of a number of, of, of issues and concerns around her safety uh, throughout that period of time uh, and uh, finished her career in ways, at least the early part of her career, uh, in a way that's quite unusual uh, in the sense that I ask her this all the time, you know, uh, Joan, why? Why did you do this? I mean, you are, uh, you know, a, a white woman, number one. Uh, number two, uh, from a family that uh, that uh, certainly this was not something that you had to do in terms of resources. Why? Why do this? 
and I'm gonna have her ask. To, I'm, I'm gonna have her actually share that question. Uh, the answer to that question a little later on in her own words because it has convicted me ever since I met her. And so I'm so glad to call her a friend and a mentor uh, and just an inspiration. Joan Mulholland. Joan, thank you for being here today. And next up is Jonathan Spires. Uh, Jonathan is a student uh, at Montgomery College and just uh, uh, really met him recently. Uh, he comes to us as a person who is looking to make changes and to make a difference in the lives of those who attend Montgomery College. He's more associated directly with the Tacoma Park campus, uh, but has influences throughout uh, uh, the entire uh, campus community. Uh, he is a person involved in his academic pursuits uh, and has been involved more recently involved in terms of his medical career, in terms of trying to pursue that as well. And so at any rate, we'll get back with all these persons. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for being here, sir. I really appreciate you. And I'm looking forward to your comments to add this youth perspective uh, to, this, uh, to this panel. So thank you all. So Tina, I'm going back to you. Uh, and I'm asking all of you to deal with this question. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background and how is it you end up being in the movement as it were? What, what, what kind of brought you to this space and place uh, uh, as you look back uh, uh, in your life? Well, I was born into a family of service, so I didn't have much of a choice. And I stand on the shoulders of my forefathers. Community service and getting involved was installing me in a very early age. It was of great importance. So now there was segregation and then there was integration. And now what I believe is called the second coming of the Jim Crow reborn. And I want to share with the audience that segregation was a very painful experience. Also, as a community activist, educator, historian, you went through all that. I was born on May 26, 1938 in a Freemans community called Jerusalem. It was made by the slaves because they felt they had reached the promised land and so they named the community Jerusalem. And so, we grew up in a very hostile environment. Jim Crow, you had no rights. It was decided what you would be called, Negro, colored, whatever they decide. You had no choice in terms of your education pursuit, uh, where you went for medical care, uh, what schools you went to, because there were only three black schools in the entire community that we had to travel to. But I joined the NAACP in Rockville when I was 13 years old. I continued to live, spend my formative years with my grandparents in Poolsville. So my siblings, my dad, and they all moved down to Rockville. So at 13, I'm still very much aware that things are separate and very unequal. And that just was a source of a really sore spot for me. And so when I joined the NAACP, we had a clear goal to integrate all public accommodations in Montgomery County. We just want to make things that were fair and equal for everybody. So the Clark family in Rockville were known as the troublemakers. We could be arrested at any time for any reason at all. Didn't have to have a reason, just happened to see us. So in terms of the black resistance, and I just want to end right here, the injustice was in your face constantly. And even at an early age, I was aware that all these uh, accommodations were paid for by my parents' tax dollars. However, we had, we were not entitled to any of those things. We couldn't even go to the swimming pool. We had to get on a bus, go to Washington, D.C., to Banneker High School just to swim one day a week. And so, I just knew that I was committed to that process to make things better for everybody. And I said, we're going to make it better or we're going to die trying. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Tina. What are your thoughts? Well, I think you're on mute. Yeah, we can. Yeah, you're still on mute, I think, Willie. What about now? You're good to go. Okay, Your thoughts, good. Willie. Your thoughts. Yeah. I, I was I grew up in a deep south, very segregated. One school for the entire county for blacks, one teacher in the school, 
no air conditioning in the summertime. If we went to school during the summer, most times we had to work in fields during the summer. We had a pot belly stove that was really something that I enjoyed watching because the boys would go out and gather wood and bring in and we were cozy and nice, but the books that we used were tattered. Sometimes the pages were missing. They were all hand-me-downs. I could not drink from the same fountain as the kids that I babysat. I could not try on clothes in the stores. I could not try on shoes in the stores. If I walked down the street and I saw someone that did not look like me, I had noticed from my grandparents especially to move over and make sure that the streets were given to the in other individuals. Life was difficult, very difficult, but somehow, some way with a praying grandmama, I was able to just make it. So that's the way I grew up. And I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. Thank you, Willie. Joan, your thoughts. You can hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, my thoughts is, that, you know, what is this white girl doing in this program? Because <laughs> you're my friend. <laughs> well, thank you. And I look forward to continuing to be your friend. But I grew up in Arlington, Virginia, and I was completely oblivious to segregation. Um, didn't have any black friends, of course. And well, I became aware of things when I was 10 down visiting grandma in Georgia and my girlfriend and I snuck off and went through the colored section of town. And what did it for me was when I got to the colored school, it was a one room structure, never had any paint, no glass or screens in the windows, just wooden shutters, pot bellied stove. You could see this was in the summer, of course, um, no electricity, no running water. And I knew out the other end of town was the fanciest building for miles and miles around a brand new brick school for the white kids. And I knew this was wrong. This was not doing what we learned in Sunday school about treating other people the way we wanted to be treated. So I couldn't have put it in words, but I sort of resolved that when I had a chance to make things the way they should be, I would seize the moment. Now, I got involved in sit-ins. Once they got going, I was at Duke University and the NCC students invited us to join them. But now when I got back to DC and ended up with the Howard Group and was out in um, Montgomery County, went to Laneco, I say, you got to use what you got. I had a white skin. I had gone to Laneco as a kid every summer big event. So I knew the routine of going in, buying tickets, and you had to have a ticket to hand over for each ride you wanted. Well, I went in, bought a handful of tickets, came back out and gave them over to the other students who couldn't have bought them, and they made a dash for the merry-go-round and hopped on ticket in hand and got arrested. Mm -hmm. So I say that was my contribution to Montgomery County. And I think Gifford's ice cream, too. I went in and ordered some and shared it. Um, but that, that was sort of pretty much my Montgomery County connection until now. Thank you, Joan. I don't know if, if uh, uh, are you uh, there, uh, Jonathan? I am I here. Am there he is. There he is. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, again, the question to you as well. Uh, your yeah. thoughts about uh, the framework for you? Sure. So I did not grow up completely in Montgomery County. Um, I didn't even completely grow up in Prince George's County. I was born at Georgetown University Hospital. I grew up some, some uh, here and there, but all in Maryland. Um, it wasn't really until high school that I got settled in, in PG County. 
and um, attended Oxino High School, graduated from there. And then I came to Montgomery County um, to get back into school. Um, so I grew up a little bit in schools that were predominantly white, and I then grew up in schools that were predominantly black. Um, I did attend George Mason for a little bit, but then um, I had to start working because I just didn't have the money. And then I, as, as I mentioned, came here to get back into school and saw a very diverse community. So I never, I can't say that I've ever experienced uh, segregation or really integration because by the time that I, I got into school, we were all integrated and we were dealing with a different social, uh, different kind of social dynamic. Um, and we and we still are now dealing with a different social dynamic. And so that's really the setting that I, I'm, I'm coming into is, is where we are now um, from where you wonderful women have have spoken um, in the context that you all have gone through already. Thank you for the opening comments, folks. Let's, let's dive in. So so here we go. Our theme is black resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at what point uh, did you all believe or think then that um, what you were doing was important, not in terms of the obvious, but in terms of it really having and possibly making a difference well beyond the experience you were going through at that time. Uh, let's, let's start with you uh, on this uh, first question, Tina. So, so when did you know? And, and did you know? Did you know? Did you know it was it was a, a important work, impactful work? Uh, how, were you there at that point in time? Help us understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you knew you had to have a total commitment to the process. And as I said early on, you knew you had to make things better. No one should have to or could continue to live that way. And so the Freedom Rise to Glenico, as I said before, was was scary. And, and the thought of grown adults, adult people spitting and hitting and pushing and shoving children, old, older Americans to the ground, I knew that this is a problem that has to be fixed. Now, my sister, my brother, they want to ride on that wooden roller coaster. They want to swim in the pool. I personally just want to ride on the carousel. I thought the horses were beautiful. So when it was finally achieved, our goal of integration, and we did get there, most of the rides were discontinued. And guess what? And the pool was filled in with concrete. And so we were arrested at that point a lot. Uh, if you go to Glenaco now, you will see there is a tower with a spiral staircase, and they use it now as a painting gallery. When we were arrested, we were all shoved into that little area. There are no windows in there. Well, there are now, but at that time, there were no windows in it, and there was zero circulation. So we had lots of people passing out. And so when they thought we'd been punished long enough, then they would unlock the door and let us out. And so all of this, this was just, just, uh, it was just out of order for me. And you know, the thing I want to say about black resistance, people are resistant to change, good or bad. And if it's out of your comfort, comfort zone, it makes people uncomfortable. And it's very fear-based and oppositional. But guess what? I have had to do this all of my life. Nobody cared about making me comfortable. For 85 years of my life, I've had to make adjustments to other people. Don't move too quickly. Don't stand around their purses. Don't look them directly in the eye. Do this. Don't do this. So I've had to do those things, and I continue to have to do those things in the year 2023, I'm very sorry to say. So, you know, I've spent more than 75 years of my life uh, promoting civil rights and I care about economic justice for my community. And so here's something that we used to say to each other. We claim ourselves every single right that belongs to free born Americans, whether it's political, civil, social, economic, as well as the pursuit of a good education. And I will stop there. So Tina raises some interesting points about this being a continuing way, even here in 2023. Joan, yeah. react to that. I mean, when did you know? When did you know that the work you were doing uh, had some long lasting, or could potentially have uh, some long lasting kinds of impact to make things, quote, better? Was there a time? Uh, we knew it had a lasting impact when Johnson signed into law the Civil Rights Act. And then 
After the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Johnson went before a joint session of Congress, mm -hmm. discussed the, me the beating of Mama Boynton in detail, and said, we must have a Voting Rights Act and we shall overcome. Lean toward the cameras and repeated it. We shall overcome. Amen. Those three words were the death knell of the Southern Democratic Party that propelled him to the presidency. And I talked to folks who were working at the White House at, at that time, and he knew exactly what he was doing and the, what the consequences would be. And hey, we got the first person elected, black person elected as a governor in the entire United States right here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Doug Wilder, who served in Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. Now, if that's not changed, I don't know what we're waiting on. <laughs> but um, I could see that the work we were doing for civil rights, voting rights, all that, that it definitely had an impact. And Obama traced the election his election as president back to the four guys who were sitting in in Greensboro. So what we were doing had a lasting effect. Mm -hmm. Willie, would you, how would you characterize your experience? And again, you, you are someone is, and I know a little bit about the story, uh, but uh, were you aware again of the essential part uh, uh, that the movement was playing, it's particularly as the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, forming uh, there in Atlanta, Georgia. Speak to that. When I first realized that what we were doing was important, when I accompanied Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his four other staff members on a people-to-people -people tour of the state of Alabama on December 6, I said 1962, when we went into the homes of the people that would actually be doing the marching, not the preachers, but the people that would actually be doing the marching and mm -hmm. to hear their stories and to find out how fearful they were, but how committed they were. They knew they could possibly lose their lives. They knew they could lose their jobs. They knew that their children's education would be disrupted because they wouldn't have money to pay if they would lose their jobs. They, and they just knew that everything they had would be put on the line. However, when I saw the commitment of these people to take these chances in order to gain their freedom, I realized that what we were doing would have a lasting impact on their lives, on our lives, and on everybody in the United States of America and abroad. Therefore, I decided myself to make a commitment, a total commitment to the civil rights activities that Dr. King was fighting for. So I continued to travel with him. Everywhere he went, I was right there. Even if it meant just typing, taking shorthand, filling the water pitchers, getting their lunch, making the coffee, whatever contribution I could make, I willingly did it because I realized that people were hurting and that people needed relief from the oppression that they did not choose to involve themselves in. So that was my first introduction to the work that was really important. Just sitting, reading the brochures and attending meetings and what have you didn't have the same impact. But when you talk to people who are actually going to involve themselves in the process, mm -hmm. it makes a difference. Were you ever afraid at any point in time? I know that Tina mentioned that she was sometimes afraid. We'll ask her about that more about that. But were you ever afraid at any point in time doing that, uh, canvassing the state of Alabama and going into those homes that you mentioned? I was afraid when we were riding in the car with Dr. King because there were many threats on his life. The Justice Department, the local police said, cancel your trip, King, because we can't protect you. There are credible threats on your life. Now, Dr. King called us together, the six of us, and said he would understand if we didn't want to continue 
the tool. Well, I thought, gee whiz, we were in Gadsden, Alabama, then we were all going back to Atlanta. Well, no one else said they were going back, so I, I didn't want to embarrass myself. I stayed also. But there were many nights on that tour that I would go to bed and not realize whether or not I would wake up the next morning because the threats were real. When we were driving in the cars, we were accosted several times by just pure down home redneck bullies. They were great when there were a lot of them together. Mm -hmm. They were just, they were the meanest people that you've ever seen. And the things that they hurled at us in the motel, they would say, come out Martin Luther Coon so we can hang you. You know, and Dr. King would not be upset at all. And I was wondering, why aren't you under the bed or somewhere, <laughs> you know, hide yourself. And he's just walking around talking to us, having meetings in the motel while all these threats are going on out there. So it changed my whole perspective of number one, he was first of all a Baptist minister before a civil rights worker. And I felt that this man must have some special connection with upstairs because we are being protected and we have not been killed yet. So mm -hmm. yes, I was afraid. I cried in the car when, whenever we were threatened. When you look around and you see people with shotguns and some of them <laughs> aiming at the car and Dr. King acts like nothing's going on and Dorothy Cotton singing freedom songs and Willie King crying. Yes, I was afraid. I was the youngest one. So, and this was a totally new experience for me. How about you, Joan? Ever afraid? No, I, I don't do fear. <laughs> I do. <laughs> You've got to be concerned and aware of your environment, but fear oh, will paralyze yeah. your brain right. and keep you from knowing what you need to be doing to, sit, to stay as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, Jim, mm -hmm. while one of my greatest fears was for my, my father who was arrested at least five times a week coming home from work, pulled over for any reason. If he wasn't home by dinner time, my mom had a strategy, just call my uncle Sam Clark and he'd just go down to the jail, the red brick courthouse. And that's where he would always find my father. So I was always afraid for my parents and my siblings. There were times when I was afraid as well, especially when you're arrested and you go to jail and you're not even entitled to a phone call. Are you kidding me? My students say, well, couldn't you call your parents? Certainly not. And so mom's only job was to stay home and sit by that phone and wait for a phone call, maybe a call or somebody who saw us being arrested. And then her job was to call the NAACP legal fund and then they would send someone down to get us out of jail. But I mean, the threats in the jail was, all you little ends are going to die in here. Your parents are never gonna find your bodies, all kinds of things. So we all huddled in one place in the jail cell, just crying out tears and just bawling. Tears is coming everywhere. All the waterworks was on. And sometimes you're there eight or nine hours before someone come down to let you out. So that, those were scary times, but all over Montgomery County, Whites only the fun, the water fountain, the the oh, he for heaven's sake, you couldn't go to the bathroom. I remember my uh, doctor saying to me once, he said, You know, it's very important to go to the bathroom before you travel because a lot of people that's what they die from when their bladders erupt in an automobile accident. He said so. I said, Well, my grandmother says, Always go to the bathroom before you travel. And he said, Well, that was a good idea. And I said, Well, it's not the idea you think it was. It meant nobody's gonna let you go to their bathroom. So you better go before you leave home. I mean, you could maybe stop on side the road and then somebody watches while you go in the bushes and that kind of thing. But but no, it was just seeing those signs all the time. I can't do this, I can't go, I can't. You know, there were times when I had white friends that they didn't tell their parents. And so one day the little girl who taught me how to roller skate came to me and said, I can't play with you anymore. So I'm thinking, did I say something? Did I do something? Did I offend you? And so I asked her those questions. She said, no, because you are colored. And I thought about that. 
I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and she said, my mom says I can't play with colored children. So I often wonder now whatever happened to her, but she actually taught me how to roller skate. We were really good friends until her mom discovered what color I was. But the experiences of just living in Montgomery County, I cannot tell you how scary that really was. I mean, people knocking on your doors. We came into Montgomery County. Um, segregation was so hard for a lot of my relatives. They moved out of the county. They went to live in California. They went to um, New Jersey. They went to New York. And so when my cousin from New York would come to visit us, Selena Clark, he was stopped by the police as he came into Rockville. Who are you going to go visit? How long you plan to be there? He had to show all kinds of ID. And so uh, Selena decides stay one day later. And we were all in bed sleep. It's like seven in the morning. And you hear this tremendous knock on the door, like they're knocking the door down. So I ran downstairs first and said, where's that boy from New York? He was supposed to leave yesterday. And so my cousin got up, got dressed and left. And he says, I don't think I'm coming back to visit you anymore. It was just that intense where people were monitoring all of your behavior. Everything you did was under their scrutiny. And that was our police department in Rockville. Jonathan, when you hear things like this, and I know a lot of people may be listening and those who may uh, say, well, you know, this really is history and, and, and uh, maybe even ancient history to some degree. Uh, but you you are someone who mentioned a minute ago that you really haven't had a chance to sort of experience, uh, you said, integration as well as segregation because you kind of lived in both worlds, as it turns out, uh, in your upbringing in uh, here, not only in Montgomery County, but also in Prince George's County. So when you hear things like this, what's your impression of of, of these kind of experiences that you're hearing uh, th uh, this morning uh, from someone who is on the other side of the age continuum? Um, is this, in fact, important today? Is it important that we hear these kinds of stories? And even though there'd be some people, Jonathan, who would say that this is not my history. This is not something for which I was involved with. It's not my fault. I, I, I can't be held accountable for these things that occurred at a time where Again, I was not even here. I didn't even exist. Jonathan, yeah. can you defend or can you again uh, 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 share that particular uh, point of view? I think um, from a psychological perspective, it is a great coping mechanism to want to live in a bubble and say that, you know, I'm focused on my, my academic career, my professional career, mm -hmm. so much so that I'm not really concerned with the social issues that are looming over my head. Um, but when I hear these stories, it, it does bring to mind the social issues that are going on right now. And I'm I'm reminded of the fact that lynchings are still happening today. Um, and one thing that stands out um, as far as, you know, this social dynamic that we have, unfortunately, is that the victims of uh, police brutality and overuse of force um, are actually men that are like in their 40s and 50s, which means that me, someone who's in their 20s, can live their whole life in their professional career and still be killed by a police officer. Without a doubt. Which, mm -hmm. which bothers me. You know, it's not, you know, you ladies are explaining some of the fears that you experienced when you were my age, but now I'm saying, well, what happens when I actually grow up into a grown man and I have an, a, a, you know, a family and children? That's when the real risk starts. You know, um, I can manage to survive this entire time and then still be still be killed or still be hung. That that's really concerning. So, you know, I, I may not have to deal with the fear of segregation, but like I said, the social dynamics are different. It doesn't mean that they're entirely better or entirely more comfortable or, or less dangerous. They're different. Um, but but black people still have to deal with the, you know, living with the risk of being you know targeted by police officers for something as basic as a traffic stop, um, but something even more, more, more dangerous. You know, um, these mass killings are also very frequent um, and some of our worst cities, our center city, Chicago, New Orleans, Baltimore, they're seeing the violence again, you know, that that our that our parents were speaking of, you know, when when I was born, I was born in 93. So, you know, the, the violence was there. But then when I was growing up, I, I know we didn't see it, you know, as much in the 2000s, early 2000s. But now we're seeing it again. So it's it's a different social dynamic, but it is just as violent and just as dangerous now. It just looks a little different. 
That's true. Our theme today is Black Resistance, and we've got a wonderful panel. Hope you're enjoying it out there. If you've got questions that you might want to ask our panel, we're having you to refer those to the chat. We'll try to pick those up and get those into the mix uh, and have our panelists try to deal with those questions as well. Uh, I want to ask a question. Please, 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 please. I want to ask Willie. She was talking about traveling with Dr. King in Alabama. Did you all ever sleep on the floor like we did in um, Mississippi? So if bullets come through the window. Most certainly I learned to sleep on the floor again, but it wasn't a problem because I had to sleep on the floor when I was a child on pallet. But yes. we did because Me the, too. The, yes, the bullets were coming through the window. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that was so scary when we were in Gadsden, Alabama, is the hotel motel owner armed himself and a couple of other guys and dr king said that's suicidal don't even think it because they wanted to start firing back at those people that were firing into the motel but mm -hmm. dr king said you, you you're out armed we meet this kind of with resistance with love we just we just pray now and we just hope for the best. And would you believe somehow after a certain period of time, the shooting stopped? I was not only on the floor, Joan, I was under the bed. Okay. It was mighty dusty under there, but I, I chose that you as a under the bed too. Now I, I never was under made the bed. it that far. But. but you know, speaking of today, I have a home in Georgia. And my, it's a gated community with about three minorities in there. Okay. And there's, for lack of a better word, they're just Trump signs in a lot of places in there. So that doesn't bother us. People do what they want to do. My alarm system went off. Luckily, my contractor was at my house. Because as soon as the alarm system went off, the police were there in about 10 minutes. I'm smiling going to got to he had gotten into my garage somehow. I don't know how he got in there, but he was in the garage. And I opened the door to the hallway. He put his hand on his pistol. And I'm talking about in the last year or so. Mm. Luckily, Marcy, who is not black, was behind me, my contractor. And it seemed that he thought maybe I was in the wrong place. <laughs> so she recognized this officer for being someone that she was in class with. So she called him by name, which she sort of relaxed, but he still had his hand on his pistol. I could have been blown to bits. Yep. Because in my own home. Mm -hmm. So they, think, they, you can they think they things about. You can think things are better if you want to under certain circumstances. Yeah. I no longer drive to Georgia by myself because oh. I have been followed on the highway driving mm -hmm. from Maryland to Georgia. My husband said, no way. It's just too dangerous. And never at night. Never so, at so, night. Wait, wait, wait never a minute for a night. second. Now, now we, we, we have come through a point in time where we were, Joan had mentioned, we elected the first black governor in the state of Virginia. And of course, you all know we were elected to the first black governor in the state of Maryland yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Things are better, right? I mean, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of get a handle on this from the standpoint of this uh, strategically. I the think strategies the that they, you all used, the actual the strategies they that you all used. The more they stay the same. So you're saying then were, were these strategies that you all employed, were they not effective, but if and or were they effective to a point? I, well, racial yeah, help us understand. racial profiling continues to be a problem here in Montgomery County, and it's based on what kind of car you drive and then they run your tags and they know exactly where you live. So it depends on what mood they're in now. And so they just follow you. And when I reported this recently to our chief, he said, well, that doesn't make any sense because that's out of his area. Well, I don't think that made any difference to the police officer who was tailing me for about 10 miles. And, uh, and I said that to, to our chief. I said, I know when he got in behind me, when my dad taught us how to drive during segregation, he taught us how to look straight ahead, but how to look in that rear view mirror so you can see 
who is behind you. And at night, you look for something different. One light, not as bright as the other, but something. So you know it's the same car. So I continue to watch him. Now, in theory, you could say he was behind me because he was going home. He's off duty. But he had many opportunities to pass me. When we got to the belt, we what? There are four lanes? He stayed right behind me. And when he decided that he had done whatever he needed to do, he just took off and left me. Now, he's going so fast, they say, well, get his tag number, get the car number. But they go so fast, you can't get any of those things. I was able to say where it happened, what time of day it happened, and a brief description of the white officer as he went by me. So you, you live in the, that fear right now. But, but Jim, very little has changed in some areas of our society. One, as I just said, is racial profiling. You don't go in certain parts of D.C. or Virginia at night, certainly not by yourself. And so my theory is always wherever I am or whatever I'm doing, get out before dark. Because I like to go to <laughs> Leesburg, Virginia, to the antique shops. I know I have to be out of there by five o'clock or there's going to be a problem. So we still live in constant fear of not being able to get back home alive. And the other thing about home is, as Willie just indicated, where can you be safe? If you can't be safe in your own home, where can you be safe? But well, we know we are not safe in our own home. And so those things continue to, to uh, bother me. And, and I, I worry about my safety all the time because I live in Poolsville and uh, we don't have a police station there. Um, but those things are still very scary for me. At 85 years old, I'm still really afraid in my own house. So I have all these alarms, cameras all around the house. And cameras always taking pictures. And, and so I just live in constant fear. And that's no way to live. Especially at Jonathan, my age, that's no way to live. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, Jonathan, you're hearing this. I mean, is this your experience? I mean, are you afraid to move about uh, uh, in the DMV? Uh, and, and not only from your own perspective, but you talk to colleagues. You are also the uh, editor of your newspaper there on campus. Uh, what are folks telling you? I mean, is, is this your experience today in 2023? Um, I think Joan said it best. I don't I don't live in fear. I don't I deal with fear, but I deal with fear with wisdom or try to deal with fear with wisdom. Um, I recognize that there are some things that are going to make me afraid and I should try in those moments to use that as an opportunity to act, not to just be afraid. And um, in regards to, you know, the situation that we have today, actually, I think that racism isn't just um, unique to to the black community. It seems to be a, a, a trait that you can see in almost any culture. I mean, if you look at the uh, the Asian community, for example, and I was speaking to some of my my uh, Asian uh, co-workers about it and I asked them, are, are Koreans just racist to black people or Chinese just racist to black people? And she was like, no, I think Koreans are racist to everybody. So um, I think prejudice is something that exists within communities, um, within the subpopulation in that community that is kind of uh, traditional or, or, or conservative or, or rather just prefers to be more exclusive and not really open to recognizing other backgrounds and other, other people and other cultures. And unfortunately, we still live in a country where um, the white community has set up so many systems where that prejudice is seen most apparent in their community. But I do, I do believe that it exists. Even in the black community, there are some African Americans that are closed-minded to believing that you know someone within the white community could help us or could be helpful for the black community. And that's we know that that's not true. But it does go to show that that closed minded uh, type of mindset exists, not just in the white community, but the conversation really is how how it exists in all of our communities and how we're addressing it there. It doesn't make me afraid. It does make me aware of it um, and does let me know that, again, my life isn't completely secure no matter where I go. And, and, and as we mentioned, even if you know I'm here in my own home, it's at risk. If I'm at the hospital working, it's definitely at risk. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I recognize that and I try to take the proper precautions to be safe um, and, and wisdom of fear. To all of you, what, what about today's movements? What was your 
perception or impressions of the movements today. I Black just want to say Matters, one thing to this yes, gentleman. You please. may not be afraid, and thank God you're not. But for you, I am afraid. Mm -hmm. And for my godsons and my mm -hmm. godchildren and my grandsons mm -hmm. that look like you, mm -hmm. I'm afraid for them when they're on the highway. When yes, my sir. god grandson drives from here to Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm mm -hmm. on edge until I know that he's back home. Mm -hmm. it, you, you know, I've had my guns, godson pulled over near Richmond. And the mm -hmm. cop said, don't you ever come back through here again because you're going to jail because you're smart mouth. Brandon's a lawyer. So he hops out and goes, what's the problem, officer? Why are you stopping me? Mm -hmm. You know, and the officer was not happy with that kind of response. Yeah. Dear heart, if you jump out of your car and you <laughs> say to the officer, what's the problem? Your Why question? are you stopping me? You not and I need to talk. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm sorry, Jim. I'm finished with this. <laughs> No, that, that's quite right. That's yes, quite right. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for, for, for that. I think it's important to, to hear that. Uh, but I want to get to something else, folks. I want you to, to, to sort of help us kind of bring together some other thoughts here as we uh, our time is moving us pretty well here. And this is this. What about the other movements today? What was your impressions about those movements? The Black Lives Matter, you've got, of course, the issue of police reform, the issue of, again, the concerns that happen with the LBT, LBGTQ community, as an example. Uh, what do you... Do you think those movements are are granular enough to move to a point where we have seen significant change, the changes you all saw in the movements you all were involved in? How do you see that today? And what are your perceptions? Anybody? Let me in. speak to one and then I'll be finished with the rest of them. Black yeah. Lives Matter. Let me mm -hmm. just speak to that. And I don't share the opinion of a lot of my coworkers, my family and what have you. I'm old school. All lives matter. I right. want to say black lives matter also. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't like the divides. I'm trying to pull people together, not single them out into any specific category. Because mm -hmm. if you do that, to me, you create a divide. I mm -hmm. want all uh, I want all lives to matter. Black, white, green, yeah, whatever let all lives. I do not have an opposition mm -hmm. to the statement Black Lives Matter. That's not what I'm saying. But I am one who believes in inclusiveness. Right. And I believe that all lives matter. Maybe mm -hmm. because Blacks have been in the situation that we have been in, special mm -hmm. emphasis need to be put on certain things in certain areas, but all lives matter to me. I don't have anything to say about anything else. I might be missing something somewhere along the line, but I don't feel like the movements today have a specific enough goal and solution yeah. to stay You're right. like we used to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. They, I think they are more reactive as opposed to being proactive. Um, yeah. They can gather up thousands of people in about five minutes to meet at a certain location. And then it's done until there's another crisis. So I think they need a plan of action and some action steps and timelines. Be more specific in terms of whatever the event is that they want to help to solve. I don't see total in our, the way that we integrated Montgomery County or dealt with these issues, we were committed to the process. So I don't think there's a total commitment to the process. They just come do what they need to do and then they disperse and they're gone until there's another event. So I think it's just got to be more organized and just not reacting. And you have to understand that they have more resources than we had. So they ought to be much better at this. I mean, we didn't have all the media and all the social norms and those kinds of things. Matter of fact, we didn't have radio. We didn't have TV. We didn't have any of those things. We just went on our total commitment to the process, to whatever we believed in, and we persisted until we reached that goal. And I don't, I don't see that happening today. They just show up in large numbers, do what they got to do, and then they're gone and you don't see them anymore. You state that much better than I do. Okay. We're, we're on the same page. Thank you. 
Joe. J J Jonathan, I, again, I, I don't want to make you the person who has to defend everything here, but on behalf of the youth, but uh, there's a question also uh, uh, in uh, our chat that I do want to honor, uh, and this uh, it speaks to what we're talking about, so it's very appropriate. Uh, what strategies uh, can you use, we use, to get more youth involved in these social justice issues? So I think the question uh, was right on point with that question. Uh, and Jonathan, again, speak up, my brother. I, I need you to represent. So what, what, what do you think? Um, my my mom taught me one time to take the lower seat in situations like this so i, I try to be humble because I'm, I'm in the company of people that are much much older and wiser than i am so um that being said i don't mind uh, defending and can defend uh, what these ladies have spoken to because although it is very real that that you know what they're speaking about and that we are living a, still living a very risky life the fact of the matter is um you know, it was just said that we have a lot more resources. Why? It's because of the work that you all did. So all the movements that have been going on up until this point and are still going on to this point have made it such that we are in the position that we are in now. Mr. Stowe, you are a government official. That alone speaks to the work that is being, has been done. That alone speaks to the amount of resistance that we can exhibit, not just, you know, in one lifetime, but over years in order to make that even possible for you. And you've been in that role for a long time now. So mm -hmm. that speaks alone to the amount of resistance that we're able to show. And it speaks to the success rate of, you know, of these movements. They may not have, you know, a clear direction right now, but that's because we're in the moment. I, I remember that even with COVID, the problem was we were just dealing with something that may have been around for a while, but it was unbeknownst to us. So now we have to come up with some type of strategy and all the scientists and all the hospitals with the all the autonomous type of uh, regime, they all have to come up with some type of strategy that works together. Well, that's very difficult to do. And now you have a lot of young people that have all these resources, but they're from so many different backgrounds. You don't have just black, young black people coming together. You have young black people coming together with young Asians, with young Hispanics, these mm -hmm. these these communities are now they're unified they may not have a clear direction but they're unified and they're ready to move they're ready to do something i think the issue is what what do we do now that we're ahead now that we're in this position i, I think about the, the the story of the tortoise and the hare and it has always made me laugh because i always think about the hare running so fast and getting hands like hey i'm about to win Dang, shit, did I forget something at home? Should I go get something to eat? And that is really what is the Harris downfall is that he moved so fast to get to the end is that before he even finished the race, he didn't even realize that he was, you know, he had to finish the race. And it's just so, so, so busy thinking about all this time that he has, all these possibilities. We are kind of in the same situation. We have so many resources, so much time, so many people that want to help. We don't really know what to do with it all, you know? So it's kind of like, it's not that we don't have you know, the, the manpower is we don't have the leadership and we don't really know what the goal is. We don't really know what the next step is. We don't really know what to ask for. Um, I, I think that speaks to, you know, some education on, you know, the legal system, how laws get passed, you know, bill drafting, uh, lobbying. I think if we understood those processes more, then we'd know what the next step was. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have, have not always been that attracted to politics. And now I'm seeing more um, more names, you know, in, in the elections and in the runnings that are foreign names, you know, and, and, and I'm kind of concerned that okay. we're going to miss that, too. You know, it, it, we wanted to have more black black seats in Congress. Well, we're going to end up having more, you know, international seats in Congress and that they may be black, but they may be just be African and not African-American. And then so we might be, you know, we might be unhappy with that as well. So I think with more direction. <laughs> to how to get things passed in the legal system um, is it, necessary for us to see the solid change, you know, uh, that, that, that'll that become a legacy for the Black community in the future. Thank you, but John. But we do have resistance now, I will say that. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, John, for interrupting that. Thank you. You, you want to finish your comment. Go, please go ahead and finish your comment. No, but I, I would say that we have shown a great amount of resistance and, and, and that is most apparent in, you know, the four of you here. I'm I'm your legacy, but you guys are the evidence that 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 resistance has been working for several, several decades now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Jonathan. W Willie, a question has come in for you and uh, it kind of ties in again this whole idea about where we are today. And, and, and the uh, question is this, um, work with Dr. King. 
what would you think he would, uh, how would he react uh, uh, to uh, some of the pressures or impressions he would have? Uh, let me make sure I get the question right here. How, what would be, what would be his impressions of the current issues, including police brutality that are going on in today's communities? And so, so look then at, at what's happening today. How would Dr. King react and what would be his impressions of these current social issues? Your thought. My thinking is number one, Dr. King was nonviolent. Violence has just erupted in every aspect of our lives today. From our schools, from our churches, on January 6th, on Capitol Hill, violence just seems to be a way of life for people now. You can't have a good fish fight anymore. People pull out a gun or a knife and blow you away. So Dr. King would be very, very disappointed in the lack of progress that we have made in getting rid of violence in this country. Violence just does not work. That's number one for him. Number two, the fact that there's absolutely no respect for people, for human life. You remember Dr. King talked about love as a way of dealing with situations that existed. You know, that was his way of resisting just showing people love in the midst of the hate that they were putting out there for you. We make two steps forward and five steps backwards in this area. There is absolutely no respect in the classrooms, in the churches, in business, anywhere you go. People have lost their moral uh, values, which is just absolutely not there. People just don't care about one another. Any book that you pick up, look how many times there's the word love in the Bible. I mean, love is the only way that we're going to make it. we got to love one another. That's one of the major commandments that we try to live by. So Dr. King being a minister, and that's what I'm speaking for these things that are coming from the book, he would not be pleased with the way that we treat each other. The progress, lack of progress, for instance, on the John Lewis voting rights bill. Why would it take so much time after all we did, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, all the Bloody Sunday, all this time? And out of just pure respect for John's work and what have it seemed that that would have just glided through quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's still being held up. Dr. King would be terribly disappointed that the lawmakers in this country mm -hmm. have not seen fit to pass a law that would just make sure that voting was afforded to each and every citizen in this country. So those, those, those are my thoughts right off the cuff on how Dr. King would feel about these issues today. Joan, I want to ask this of you and Tina. So how can we now take lessons learned from the civil rights movement uh, and take the good things and, and the things that were positive in terms of strategies and outcomes and try to bridge the gap? The, the, the next question can, coming from our audience was suggesting that is there a way that we can benefit from the wisdom that was learned and somehow or another bridge the gap between movements of the past and those of today to make the ones of today more effective. Uh, any thoughts about that that uh, that question? Well, I know maybe it bump jumbled up a little bit, but what are your thoughts? Okay, I know that the American social fabric is deeply flawed. And I say to myself that if I can survive this toxic environment that I was, that I grew up in, there's got to be a way for folks who are in year 2023 with all the benefits and options they have available to them they ought to be able to do this but one thing that we learned doing um, the transition from segregation to integration was that you have to have some guardrails people have got to understand there are consequences you have to pass some laws that said if you do this this these are your consequences but but given that if it's going to be federal, a lot of these laws get passed more easily within the states. But if they're going to be federal laws, that's your holdup. 
because there are some people that still don't see African Americans as true citizens that should be guaranteed all the inherited rights of white people. So if you take a look at the guardrails, you have to put in place, if you do this, these are your consequences. When integration came, when the law, civil rights laws were passed, it didn't change their hearts. You can't legislate changing a person's heart about how they feel about you, but you can certainly make it painful when they don't abide by the laws. And so I think that's probably the first start is put some guardrails in place that make it make it more uncomfortable for people when they violate those laws. That that's what I think. Because the root causes are still oh, there. I mean, the root causes are still there. I mean, systemic racism is still here. And so you just have to take some of the things that helped us get things um, passed. Well, we had better lawmakers then, and then they w worked. Uh, across the aisle, but now you've got the folks over there. I don't care what you say, whether it's good or bad for the people uh, of America. We don't care because we're not voting for it. So maybe a better strategy would be to hopefully get some of these laws passed on a state level. But it's ultimately it's very important to get them passed on a federal level across the board. Joe, your comment. Thank you much. Well, much I am thinking on a smaller scale, but. Folks ought to talk to us old folks more. If they want to, you know, yeah. create change, they need to come to us and ask, now what did you do? Or mm -hmm. what could you recommend? That could be good. We And us old folks, we need to go to more community meetings and church meetings and bring things up with our neighbors who are in a position to influence things. We need to speak up and speak out more. Mm -hmm more places and more times and um yeah and talk to the kids too when they're doing a project in school i do that sometimes they come to me and but get them ideas too upper elementary junior high high school they could use a little new ideas and um I would say that's the best thing we can do. I tell folks that my generation took care of legal segregation, but the underlying racism is alive and well. And I offer a couple little suggestions. Um, and then I wait for them to ask me questions. Sometimes we have to start the conversation. But, you know, Joan, the one thing that is so, well, I guess we won't use the word surprising, but I guess I say unique is that racism and hatred is a learned behavior. Somebody has to teach it to you. So you know that there's a lot of teaching people how to hate each other going on in the United States of America. True. Somebody's well, teaching it. We've come to the end of our time frame uh, for this discussion, and I just want to thank all of you. But before you leave, we have to leave. Uh, I always at least try to do this on, on a, a positive note, uh, mm -hmm. and, and certainly uh, I want to ask this of you. Um, what words of encouragement, uh, what words of encouragement uh, can you offer uh, to persons out there about the role of what black resistance can mean and what advocacy can mean with and that particular realm. Just got a few minutes, so give me a, a, your best answer uh, uh, as briefly as you can. We'll start then. Um, uh, you know what? We're going to start with uh, with Jonathan. Jonathan, let's start <laughs> good, with you. Uh, uh, ahead, let, let, let's, 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 let's have you. What, what words of encouragement <laughs> would you, in fact, offer to your uh, uh, your colleagues uh, 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 and your peers? And uh, 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 give us your perspective. We'll start then. We'll go around the horn real quickly. Sure. Um, I would say that it would seem that, um, you know, the, we we know that this is true and we always joke about it, but it would seem that truly our our race was chosen because we are the most resistant. It, it, it would seem that we it, it, it made sense that, you know, it, it, it hurts us to think about it, but it made sense for us to be the ideal um, human, you know, race for slavery because we are clearly so resistant to no matter what the challenge is, what 
regardless of how long it's going to take, we will still rise to excellence, whether it be in the academic field, whether it be in entertainment, or whether it be in any social uh, social industry, we will resist and we will excel, we will prosper, and we're still doing that today. The struggles are still real, the challenges are still real, the risks are still real, but the resistance is still just as, the, as, as evident, as, as still real, the strength is still real, and the legacy is still real, and, and the legacy isn't resistance, the legacy is excellence. So while the conversation is about resistance today, Again, the legacy is how excellent and how strong and how prosperous we've always been and will always be. And that's what I would say. I would like to say that I think people should discover their God-given talents and that you should use whatever you have to benefit humanity, to do something for someone else, not to be selfish and think only about what you can do for yourself, but how you can make this world a better place for everybody, not just yourself. I don't, I'm not saying just for blacks. Just, I'm, I'm talking about for everybody, because if I make it good for myself, I can make it good for everybody else. So I want to make sure that whatever I have to offer, what little bit that I have, that it can be used to help somebody else. And I Thank think you, every person should decide what he or she can do to help something. Some I don't care how small the project. It, Joan talked about talking to children, speaking with children. It could be visiting schools. It could be talking to children in school, but telling people that they have worth and showing them that mm -hmm. everybody's part will benefit the whole. Thank you very much, Willie. Jo Joan? Well, I would encourage folks, look how much the South has changed. Mm -hmm. We're speaking on a national level. Georgia electing Black senators, Virginia and Maryland, Black governors, powerful people, in Congress from Blacks from South Carolina, more elected Black officials in Mississippi than any state in the Union for decades. And the beat just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. We can take heart for the rest of the country too. And we can keep on keeping on in the South. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joan. Uh, and I would be remiss uh, if I did not acknowledge the, uh, that uh, I am speaking with Joan Mulholland as one of the sisters of the uh, Delta Sigma Theta uh, oh, sorority. Wow. So uh, I see her jacket there. She's going to make sure that, that, that she is a sister <laughs> within that it. particular sorority. So uh, to all those in the Delta Sigma Theta uh, family, we want to make sure we did acknowledge you today. And uh, the whole uh, divine nine, we're all in. Uh, thank it. you so yes. much, and thank you so much for saying that as well. The, infi the entire divine nine. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Joan. Uh, and, and close us out, uh, Tina. Okay, well, so I don't mess this up. I actually wrote a prepared statement. So. Oh, you're way said, ahead of me. Go ahead, Joan. What did you say? No, I say you are way ahead of me having a prepared statement. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, well, okay, because <laughs> this is what I think we should do in terms of advocacy. So the first thing I think we need to that people who oppose whatever we do and don't see us as value, having any value, they need to acknowledge and honor black folks contribution to this country. Then we can start to dialogue. It is important that dialogue is authentic. Start the dialogue with one another on a level that we are all equal. Have a healthy debate, differences in perspective. And so as a black human being in the United States of America, I love the concept of a colorblind world. I envision a world in which peace and harmony would prevail and mob violence and Jim Crow laws would be eradicated. This is my vision for a better world and a more just and fair for all. Too much hate is being taught. So it is imperative that we live an impactful life. A commitment to civic responsibility is paramount. We have come a long way, but there's still much more work to do. We must work together to ensure an inclusive community. So as we move forward to challenge the status quo, 
have a healthy debate and press on until victory is won. Amen. Amen. Amen indeed. Drop Amen the mic. indeed. <laughs> Drop the mic indeed. Amen. Thank you so much to this very fine panel. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for your contribution today. Jonathan Spires with uh, you met uh, all my County. Uh, also uh, with Willie King for what you do in our committee. Thank you, Willie. With Joan Mahalan, uh, thank you so much as well. And also with uh, Tina Clark, a marvelous panel. I hope that our audience out there really appreciates all you would have done, but more importantly, your contributions today, because I know that we are certainly smarter, more informed, and clearly inspired uh, by this discussion today. So thank you one, thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, as we wrap up to our audience out there, thank you for being a part of this uh, program. Uh, we look forward to Black History Month next year, and we would hope then that today might be the beginning, if you're not already started, and a number of explorations that you'll be doing throughout the month of February. As you, in fact, learn more about Black history and learn more about the contributions of those of us who are, are Black and African American in this country, uh, and as much uh, for those of us who may find ways to share with each other. It is so important to have those conversations that maybe don't ever get had amongst many of us uh, for fear, uh, for uh, issues of concern, et cetera. Have those conversations and start with this conversation today about what you would have heard uh, and let that be the beginning of uh, these kind of courageous opportunities to reach out to folks who may not look like you. So I want to thank all of you again for being here. And as we close out, I want to thank my uh, co-moderator, uh, uh, Tiffany Ward, and all those folks involved in putting this program on today. Thank you, Juan. Thank you all. Um, uh, we now are going to a very, very important part as we leave you today. Um, it was said that if we do not share our history, we cannot learn the lessons of history. And then that's so important that if we don't share that history, we will never learn the lessons. And history, in fact, does, if does anything. It, in fact, again, teaches us as we go forward. Uh, let your own dreams, my friend, let your own dreams be your own boundaries. And we've got a young lady who will remind us about what that really means. Uh, her name is Amanda Gorman. You may remember that she was the person giving the um, actual reading at the inauguration of President Biden. Um, she was also named the very first uh, youth poet laureate uh, for the United States of America. And so let's listen to her as she shares with us uh, this famous thought. In her words, Amanda Gorman. Folks, have a great, great day. Happy Black History Month. Let's listen down to Amanda Gorman. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President. President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace in the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. 
we close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So, while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation in every corner called our country our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful when day comes we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid the new dawn blooms as we free it for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it <laughs>